Okay, so we're starting a new book. Um, this is called A Wind in the Door, and it is book two. Um, it is essentially the sequel to A Wrinkle in Time. So those of you who were in our class last year, we read A Wrinkle in Time in class. Um, those of you who were not, perhaps you've seen the movie. Um, the movie came out a couple years ago. So um, you want to watch that and kind of get caught up to where this is, you don't have to have read or seen the movie of A Wrinkle in Time to, to know what's going on. It just really helps you to um, be introduced to the characters. Um, but this is a completely new story. So this um, takes place a year later, um, a year from when we left off with the, the Wallaces, Meg and Charles Wallace, I'm sorry, the Murrays, Meg and Charles Wallace, as well as Calvin O'Keefe. So without further ado, here is A Wind in the Door, Chapter One, Charles Wallace's Dragons. There are dragons in the twins' vegetable garden. Meg Mary took her head out of the refrigerator where she'd been foraging for an after-school snack and looked at her six-year-old brother. What? There are dragons in the twins' vegetable garden. Where there were, they've moved to the north pasture now. Meg, not replying, it did not do to answer Charles Wallace too quickly when he said something odd, returned to the refrigerator. I suppose I'll have lettuce and tomato as usual. I was looking for something new and different and exciting. Meg, did you hear me? Yes, I heard you. I think I'll have liverwurst and cream cheese. She took her sandwich materials and a bottle of milk and set them out on the kitchen table. Charles Wallace waited patiently. She looked at him, scowling with an anxiety she did not like to admit to herself, at the fresh rips in the knees of his blue jeans, the streaks of dirt grained deep in his shirt, a darkening bruise on the cheekbone under his left eye. Okay, did the big boys jump you in the schoolyard this time or when you got off the bus? Meg, you aren't listening to me. I happen to care that you've been in school for two months now and not a single week has gone by that you haven't been roughed up. If you've been talking about dragons in the garden or whatever they are, I suppose that explains it. I haven't. Don't underestimate me. I didn't see them till I got home. Whenever Meg was deeply worried, she got angry. Now she scowled at her sandwich. I wish mother'd get the spreadable kind of cream cheese. The stuff keeps going right through the bread. Where is she? In the lab doing an experiment, she said to tell you she wouldn't be long. Where's father? He's got, he got a call from LA and he's gone to Washington for a couple of days. Like the dragons in the garden, their father's visits to the White House were something best not talked about at school. Unlike the dragons, these visits were real. Charles Wallace picked up Meg's doubting. But I saw them, Meg, the dragons. Eat your sandwich and come see. Where's Sandy and Denny's? Soccer practice. I haven't told anybody but you. Suddenly sounding forlorn, younger than his six years, he said, I wish the high school bus got home earlier. I've been waiting and waiting for you. Meg returned to the refrigerator to get lettuce. This was a cover for some rapid thinking. Although she couldn't count on Charles Wallace not picking up her thoughts, as he had picked up her doubts about the dragons, what he had actually seen, she had, could not begin to guess. That he had seen something, something unusual, she was positive. Charles Wallace silently watching her fin watched her finish making the sandwich, carefully aligning the slices of bread and cutting it in precise sections. I wonder if Mr. Jenkins has ever seen a dragon. Mr. Jenkins was the principal of the village school and Meg had had her own troubles with him. She had small hope that Mr. Jenkins would care what happened to Charles Wallace or that he would be willing to interfere in what he called the normal procedure of democracy. Mr. Jenkins believes in the law of the jungle. She spoke through a mouthful. Aren't there, aren't there dragons in the jungle? Charles Wallace finished his glass of milk. No wonder you always flunk social studies. Eat your sandwich and stop stalling. Let's go and see if they're still there. They crossed the lawn, followed by Fortinbras, the large black, almost Labrador dog, happily sniffing and snuffling at the rusty autumnal remains of the rhubarb patch. Meg tripped over a wire hoop from the croquet set and made an annoyed grunt, mostly at herself because she had put the wicks, wickets and mallets away after the last game and had forgotten this one. A low wall of barberry separated the croquet lawn from Sandy's and Denny's vegetable garden. Fortinbras leaped over the barberry and Meg called automatically, not in the garden, Fort, 
and the big dog backed out between rows of cabbage and broccoli. The twins were justly proud of their organic produce, which they sold around the village for pocket money. A dragon can make a real mess of this garden, Charles Wallace said, and led Make through rows of vegetables. I think he realized that because suddenly he sort of wasn't there. What do you mean he sort of wasn't there? Either he was there or he wasn't. He was there, and then when I went to look closer, he wasn't there. And I followed him, not really him, because he was much faster than I, and I only followed where he'd been, and he went to the big glacial rocks in the north pasture. Meg looked scowlingly at the garden. Never before had Charles Wallace sounded as implausible as this. He said, come on, and move past the tall sheaves of corn, which had only a few scraggly ears left. Beyond the corn, the sunflowers caught the slanting rays of the afternoon sun, their golden faces reflecting brilliance. Charles, are you all right? Meg asked. It was not like Charles to lose touch with reality. Then she noticed that he was breathing heavily as if he'd been running, though they had not been walking rapidly. His face was pale, his forehead beaded with perspiration as though from exertion. She did not like the way he looked, and she turned her mind back to the unlikely tale of dragons picking her way around the luxuriant pumpkin vines. Charles, when did you see these dragons? A dollop of dragons, a drove of dragons, a tribe of dragons, Charles Wallace panted, after I got home from school. Mother was all upset because I looked such a mess. My nose was still very bloody. I get upset too. Meg, mother thinks it's more than the bigger kids punching me. What's more? Charles Wall scrambled with unusual clumsiness and difficulty over the low stone wall which edged the orchard. I get out of breath. Meg said sharply, why? What did mother say? Charles Wall slow slowed, walked slowly through the high grass in the orchard. She hasn't said, but it's sort of like radar blipping at me. Meg walked beside him. She was tall for her age, and Charles Wall is small for his. There are times when I wish you didn't pick up radar signals quite so well. I can't help it, Meg. I don't try to. It just happens. Mother thinks something is wrong with me. But what? She almost shouted. Charles Wallace spoke very quietly. I don't know. Something bad enough so her worry blips. Something bad enough so her worry blips loud and clear. And I know there's something wrong. Just to walk across the orchard like this is an effort. And it shouldn't be. It never has been before. When did this start? She asked sharply. You were all right last weekend when we went walking in the woods. I know. I've been sort of tired all autumn, but it's been worse this week. And much worse today than it was yesterday. Hey, Meg, stop blaming yourself because you didn't notice. She had been doing precisely that. Her hands felt cold with panic. She tried to push her fear away because Charles Wallace could read his sister even more easily than he could their mother. He picked up a windfall apple, looked it over for worms, and bit into it. His end of summer tan could not disguise his extreme pallor nor his shadowed eyes. Why hadn't she noticed this? Because she hadn't wanted to. It is easier to blame Charles Wallace's paleness and lethargy on his problems at school. Why doesn't mother have a doctor look at you then? I mean a real doctor. She has. When? Today. Why didn't you tell me before? I was more interested in dragons. Charles! It was before you got home from school. Dr. Louise came to have lunch with mother. She does quite often anyhow. I know, go on. So when I got home from school, she went over me head from top to toe. What did she say? Nothing much. I can't read her the way I can read mother. She's like a little bird, twittering away and all the time you know that the sharp mind of hers is thinking along on another level. She's very good at blocking me. All I could gather was that she thought mother might be right about, about whatever it is and she'd keep in touch. They'd finished crossing the orchard and Charles Wallace climbed up into the wall again and stood there looking across an unusual pasture where there were two large outcroppings of glacial rock. They're gone, he said, my dragons are gone. Meg stood on the wall beside him. There was nothing to see except the wind blowing through the sun-bleached grasses and the two tall rocks turning purple in the autumn's evening light. Are you sure it wasn't just the rocks or shadows or something? Do rocks or shadows look like dragons? No, but Meg, they were right by the rocks, all sort of clustered together. Wings that looked like hundreds of wings, and eyes opening and shutting between the wings, and some spurts and little, some smoke and little spurts of fire. And I warned them not to set the pasture on fire. How did you warn them? I spoke to them in a loud voice, and the flames stopped. Did you go close? It didn't seem wise. I stayed here on the wall and watched for a long time. They kept folding and unfolding wings and sort of winking all those eyes at me. And then they all seemed to huddle together and go to sleep. So I went home to wait for you. Meg, you don't believe me. She asked flatly, well, where have they gone? 
you'll never not believe, you've never not believed me before. She said carefully, it's not that I don't believe you. In a strange way, she did believe him. Not perhaps that he had seen actual dragons, but Charles Wallace had never before tended to mix fact and fancy. Never before had he separated reality and illusion in such a marked way. She looked at him, saw that he had a sweatshirt on over his grubby shirt. She held her arms about herself, shivered and said, although she was quite warm enough, I think I'll go back to the house and get a cardigan. Wait here, I won't be, I won't be long. If the dragons come back, I think they will come back. Then keep them here for me. I'll be as fast as I can. Charles Wallace looked at her lovely. I don't think mother wants to be interrupted right now. I'm not gonna interrupt her. I'm just gonna get my cardigan. <sighs> okay, Meg, he sighed. She left him sitting on the wall, looked at the two great glacial deposits waiting for dragons or whatever it was he thought he'd seen. All right, he knew that she was going to go back to the house to talk to their mother, but as long as she didn't admit it out loud, she felt that she managed to keep at least a little bit, little of her worry from him. She burst into the laboratory. Her mother was sitting on a tall lab stool, not looking into the microscope in front of her, not writing on the clipboard, which rested on her knee, just sitting thoughtfully. What is it, Meg? She started to blurt out Charles Wallace's talk of dragons and that he'd never had delusions before, but since Charles Wallace himself had not mentioned them to their mother, it seemed like a betrayal for her to do so. Though his silence about the dragons may have been because of the presence of Dr. Louise. Her mother repeated a little impatiently. What is it, Meg? What's wrong with Charles Wallace? Mrs. Murray put the clipboard down on the lab counter beside the microscope. He had some trouble with the bigger boys again at school today. That's not what I mean. What do you mean, Meg? He said you had Dr. Calubra here for him. Louise was here for lunch, so I thought she might as well have a look at him. And? And what, Meg? What's the matter with them? We don't know, Meg, not yet at any rate. Charles says you're worried about him. I am, aren't you? Yes, but I thought it was all school. And now I don't think it is. He got out of breath just walking across the orchard and he's too pale and he imagines things and he looks, I don't like the way he looks. Neither do I. What is it? What's wrong? Is it a virus or something? Mrs. Murray hesitated. I'm not sure. Mother, please, if there's anything really wrong with Charles, I'm old enough to know. I don't know whether there is or not. Neither does Louise. When we find out anything definite, I I'll tell you, I promise you that. You're not hiding anything? Meg, there's no use talking about something I'm not sure of. I should know in a few days. Meg twisted her hands together nervously. You really are worried. Mrs. Murray smiled. Mothers tend to be. Where is he now? Oh, I left him on the stone wall. I said I was coming in for a cardigan. I've got to run back or he'll think. Without finishing, she rushed out of the lab, grabbed a cardigan from the hooks in the pantry and ran across the lawn. When she reached Charles Wallace, he was sitting on the wall just as she'd left him. There were no sign of dragons. She had not really expected that there would be. Nevertheless, she was disappointed. Her anxiety about Charles subtly deepened. What did mother say, he asked. Nothing. His large, deep seeing blue eyes focused on her. She didn't mention mitochondria or ferrandoli. Huh? Why would she? Charles Wells kicked the rubber heels of his sneakers against the wall, looking at Meg, did not answer. Meg persisted. Why should mother mention mitochondria? Isn't that talking about them what got you in trouble your very first day in school? I am extremely interested in them and in dragons. I'm sorry they haven't come back yet. He was very definitely changing the subject. Let's wait a little while longer. I'd rather face a few dragons any day than the kids in the schoolyard. Thank you for going to see Mr. Jenkins on my behalf, Meg. That was supposed to be a secret. Oops. That was supposed to be a deep, dark secret. How did you know? I knew. Meg hunched her shoulders, not that it did any good. She not really had much hope that it would. Mr. Jenkins had been for several, several years the principal of the large regional high school. When he, when he was moved just that September to the small grade school in the village, the official story was that the school needed upgrading and Mr. Jenkins was the only man to do the job. The rumor was that he hadn't been able to handle the wilder element over at regional. Meg had her doubts whether or not he could handle anybody anywhere. And she was completely convinced that he would, not, that he would neither understand nor like Charles Wallace. The morning that Charles Wallace set off for first grade, Meg was far more nervous than he was. She could not concentrate during her last classes, and when school was finally over, she climbed the hill to the house and found him with a puffed and bleeding upper lip and a scrape across his cheek, and she had a sinking feeling of inevitability combined with a burning rage. 
Charles Wallace had always been thought of by the village as peculiar and probably not quite all there. Meg picking up mail at the post office or eggs at the store overheard snatches of conversations. The littlest married kid is a weird one. I hear clever people often have dumb kids. They say he can't even talk. It would have been easier if Charles Wallace had actually been stupid, but he wasn't. And he wasn't very good at pretending that he didn't know more than the other six-year-olds in his class. His vocabulary itself was against him. He had, in fact, not started talking until late, but then it was in complete sentences with none of the baby preliminaries. In front of strangers, he'd still seldom spoke at all. One of the reasons he was thought dumb. And suddenly there he was in first grade and talking like, like his parents or his sister. Sandy and Denny's got along with everybody. It wasn't surprising that Charles was resented. Everybody expected him to be backward and he talked like a dictionary. Now children, the first grade teacher smiled brightly at the gaggle of new first graders starting at, staring at her that first morning. I want each one of you to tell me something about yourself. She looked at her list. Let's start with Mary Agnes. Which one is Mary Agnes? A small girl with one missing front tooth and straw colored hair pulled tightly into pigtails announced that she lived on a farm and that she had her own chickens. That morning there had been 17 eggs. Very good, Mary Agnes. Now let's see, how about you, Richard? Are you called Dickie? That little boy stood up bobbing and grinning. What have you got to tell us? Boys ain't like girls, Dickie said. Boys is made different. See, like, that's fine, Dickie, just fine. We'll learn more about that later. Now, Albertina, suppose you tell us something. Albertina was repeating first grade. She stood up almost a head taller than the others and announced proudly, our bodies are made up of bones and skinses and muscles and blood cell and stuff like that. Very good, Albertina. Isn't that good class? I can see we're going to have a group of real scientists this year. Let's all clap for Albertina, shall we? Now, uh, she looked down at her list again. Charles Wallace, are you called Charlie? No, he said, Charles Wallace, please. Your parents are scientists, aren't they? She did not wait for an answer. Let's see what you have to tell us. Charles Wallace, you should have known better, Meg scolded him that night, stood and said, what I'm interested in right now are the Ferrandoli and the mitochondria. What was that, Charles? The mighty what? Mitochondria. They and the Ferrandoli come from the prokaryotes. The what? Well, billions of years ago, they probably swam into what eventually became our eukaryotic cells, and they just stayed there. They have their own DNA and RNA, which means they're quite separate from us. They have a symbiotic relationship with us. And the amazing thing is, is that we're completely dependent on them for our oxygen. Now, Charles, suppose you stop making silly things up and the next time I call on you, don't try to show off. Now, George, you tell the class something. At the end of the second week of school, Charles Wallace paid Meg an evening visit in her attic bedroom. Charles, she said, can't you just not say anything at all? Charles Wallace in yellow footed pajamas, his fresh wounds band-aided, his small nose looking puffy and red, lay on the foot of Meg's big brass bed, his head pillowed on the shiny black bulk of the dog, Fort Brass. He sounded weary and lethargic, although she hadn't noticed this at the time. It doesn't work, nothing works. If I don't talk, I'm sulking. If I talk, I say something wrong. I finished the workbook. The teacher said, you must have helped me. And I know the reader by heart. Meg, circling her knees with her arms, looked down at, at boy and dog. Fort and Brass was strictly not allowed on beds, but this rule was ignored in the attic. Why don't they move you up to second grade? That would be even worse. They're that much bigger than I. Yes, she knew that was true. So she decided to see Mr. Jenkins. She boarded the high school bus as usual at seven o'clock in the gray, uninviting light of an early morning brewing in nor'easter. The grade school bus, which had not nearly so far to go, left an hour later. When the high school bus made its first stop in the village, she slipped off and then walked the two miles to the grade school. It was an old, inadequate building painted the traditional red, overcrowded and understaffed. It certainly did need upgrading and taxes were being raised for a new school. She slipped through the side door, which the custodian opened early. She could hear the buzz of his electric floor polisher in the front hall by the still locked entrance doors and under cover of its busy sound, she ran across the hall and darted into a small broom closet and leaned too noisily for comfort against the hanging brooms and dry mops. The closet smelled musty and dusty and she hoped she could keep from sneezing until Mr. Jenkins was in his office and his secretary had brought him his ritual mug of coffee. She shifted position and leaned against the corner where she could see the glass top of the door to Mr. Jenkins's office through the narrow crack. She was stuffy-nosed and cramp-legged when the light in the office finally went on. 
Then she waited for what seemed all day, but was most likely more like half an hour while she listened to the click of the secretary's heels on the polished tile floor. Then the roar of children entering the school as the door was unlocked. She thought of Charles Wallace being pushed along by the great wave of children, mostly much bigger than he was. It's like the mob after Julius Caesar, she thought. Only Charles isn't much like Caesar, but I'll bet life was simpler when all Gaul was divided in three parts. The bell screamed for the, for the beginning of classes. The secretary clicked along the corridor again. That would be with Mr. Jenkins's coffee. The high heels receded. Meg waited for what she calculated was five minutes, then emerged, pressing her forefinger against her upper lip to stifle a sneeze. She crossed the corridor and knocked on Mr. Jenkins' door just as the sneeze burst out anyhow. He seemed surprised to see her as well as he might and not at all pleased, though his actual words were, may I ask to what I owe this pleasure? I need to see you please, Mr. Jenkins. Why aren't you in school? I am, this school. Kindly don't be rude, Meg. I see you haven't changed any over the summer. I had hoped you would be one of my, wouldn't not be one of my problems this year. Have you informed anybody of your whereabouts? The early morning light glinted off his spectacles, veiling his eyes. Meg pushed her own spectacles up her nose, but could not read his expression. As usual, she thought, he looked as though he smelled something unpleasant. He sniffed. I have my secretary drive you to school. That will mean the loss of her services for a full half day. I'll hitchhike, thanks. Compounding one misdemeanor with another? In this state, hitchhiking happens to be against the law. Mr. Jenkins, I didn't come to talk to you about hitchhiking. I came to talk to you about Charles Wallace. I don't appreciate your interference, Margaret. The bigger boys are bullying him. They'll really hurt him if you don't stop them. If anybody is dissatisfied with my handling of the situation and wishes to discuss it with me, I think it should be your parents. Meg tried to control herself, but her voice rose with frustrated anger. Maybe they're cleverer than I am and no, it won't do any good. Oh, please, please, Mr. Jenkins. I know people have thought Charles Wallace isn't very bright, but he's really, he crud across her words. We've run IQ tests on all the first graders. Your little brother's IQ is quite satisfactory. You know it's more than that, Mr. Jenkins. My parents have run tests on him too, all kinds of tests. His IQ is so high, it's untestable by normal standards. His performance gives no indication of this. Don't you understand? He's trying to hold back so the boys won't beat him up. He doesn't understand them and they don't understand him. How many first graders know about Fair and Dolat? I don't know what you're talking about, Margaret. I do know that Charles Wallace does not seem to me to be very strong. He's perfectly all right. He is extremely pale and there are dark circles under his eyes. How would you look if people punched you in the nose and kept giving you black eyes just because you know more than they do? If he's so bright, Mr. Jenkins looked coldly at her through the magnifying lenses of his spectacles, I wonder your parents bothered to send him to school at all. If there weren't a law about it, they probably wouldn't. Now, standing by Charles Wallace on the stone wall, looking at the two glacial rocks where no dragons lurked, Meg recalled Mr. Jenkins's words about Charles Wallace's pallor and shivered. Meg asked, why do people always mistrust people who are different? Am I really that different? Meg, moving the tip of her tongue over her teeth, which had only recently lost their braces, looked at him affectionately and sadly. Oh, Charles, I don't know. I'm your sister. I've known you ever since you were born. I'm too close to you to know. She sat on the stone wall, first carefully checking the rocks. A large, gentle, and completely harmless black snake lived in the stone wall. She was a special pet of the twins, and they had watched her grow from a small snakelet to her present flourishing size. She was named Louise after Dr. Louise Calubra because the twins had learned just enough Latin to pronounce to pounce on the odd last name. Dr. Snake, Dennis had said, weirdo. It's a nice name, Sandy said. We'll name our snake after her, Louise the Larger. Why the larger? Why not? Does she have to be larger than anything? She is. She certainly isn't larger than Dr. Louise. Denny bristled. Louise the Larger is very large for a snake who lives in a garden wall, and Dr. Louise is a very small doctor. I mean, she's a tiny person. I suppose as a doctor, she's pretty mad. Well, doctors don't have to be any size, but you're right, Den. She is tiny, and our snake is big. The twins seldom disagreed about anything for long. The only trouble is she's more like a bird than a snake. Didn't snakes and birds way back in evolution, didn't they evolve originally from the same phylum or whatever you call it? Anyhow, Louise is a very good name for our snake. Dr. Louise fortunately was highly amused. 
snakes were misunderstood creatures, she told the twins, and she was honored to have such a handsome one named after her. And snakes, she added, were on the caduceus, which is the emblem for doctors, so it was almost appropriate. Louise the Larger had grown considerably since her baptism, and Meg, though not actively afraid of her, was always careful to look for Louise before she sat. Louise at this moment was nowhere to be seen, so Meg relaxed and turned her thoughts again to Charles Wallace. You're a lot brighter than tw the twins, but the twins are far from dumb. How did they manage? Charles Wallace said, I wish they'd tell me. They don't talk at school the way you do at home, for one thing. I thought if I was interested in mitochondria and ferondola, other people would be too. You were wrong. I really am interested in them. Why is that so peculiar? I don't suppose it is so peculiar for the son of a physicist and a biologist. Most people aren't interested, I mean. They aren't children of two scientists either. Our parents provide us with all kinds of disadvantages. I'll never be as beautiful as mother. Charles Wallace was tired of reassuring Meg. And the incredible thing about Ferrandala is their size. Meg was thinking about her hair, the ordinary straight brown of a field mouse, as, as against her mother's auburn waves. What about it? They're so small that all anyone could do is postulate them. Even the most powerful microelectron microscope can't show them. But they're important to us. We'd die if we didn't have ferrandoli. But nobody at school is remotely interested. Our teacher has the mind of a grasshopper. As you were saying, it's not an advantage having famous parents. If they weren't famous, you bet everybody knows when LA calls or father makes a trip to the White House, they'd be in it for two. They'd be in for it too. We're all different, our family, except the twins. They do all right, maybe because they're normal or know how to act it. But I, when I wonder what normal is anyhow or isn't, why are you so interested in Ferrandoli? Mother's working on them. She's worked on a lot of things and you haven't been interested. If she really proves their existence, she'll probably get the Nobel Prize. So that's not what's bugging you about them. Meg, if something happens to our Ferrandoli, well, it could be disastrous. Why, Meg shivered, suddenly cold and buttoned her cardigan. Clouds were set, spreading across the sky and with them a rising wind. I mentioned mitochondria, didn't I? You did, what about them? Mitochondria are tiny little organisms living in our cells. That gives you an idea of how tiny they are, doesn't it? Enough. A human being is a whole world to a mitochondrion, just the way our planet is to us. But we're much more dependent on our mitochondria than the earth is on us. The earth could get along perfectly well without people, but if anything happened to our mitochondria, we'd die. Why should anything happen to them? Charles Wallace gave a small shrug. In the darkening light, he looked very pale. Accidents happen to people, or diseases. Things can happen to anything. But what I've sort of picked up from Mother is that quite a lot of mitochondria are in some kind of trouble because of their ferrandolite. Has Mother actually told you all this? Some of it, the rest I've just guessed. The rest I've just gathered. Charles Wallace did gather things out of his mother's mind, out of Meg's mind, as another child might gather daisies in a field. What are ferrandoli then? She shifted position on the hard rocks of the wall. Ferrandoli live in a mitochondrion sort of the same way a mitochondrion lives in a human cell. They're genetically independent of their mitochondria, just as mitochondria are of us. And if anything happens to the ferrandoli in a mitochondrion, the mitochondrion gets, gets sick and probably dies. A dry leaf separated from its stem and drifted past Meg's cheek. Why should anything happen to them, she repeated. Charles Wallace repeated too. Accidents happen to people, don't they? And disease and people killing each other in wars. Yes, but that's people. Why are you going on so about mitochondria and ferrandoli? Meg, mother's been working in her lab night and day, almost literally for several weeks now. You've noticed that. She often does when she's onto something. She's onto ferrandoli. She thinks she's proved their existence by studying some mitochondria, mitochondria which are dying. You're not talking about all this stuff at school, are you? I do learn some things, Meg. You aren't really listening to me. I'm worried about you. Then listen. The reason mother's been in her lab so much trying to find the effect of ferrandoli on mitochondria is that she thinks there's something wrong with my mitochondria. What? Meg jumped down from the stone wall and swung around to face her brother. He spoke very quietly so that she had to bend down to hear. If my mitochondria gets sick, then so do I. 
all the fear which Meg had been trying to hold back threatened to break loose. How serious it? Can mom, can mother give you something for it? I don't know. She won't talk to me. I'm only guessing. She's trying to shut me out till she knows more and I can only get in through the chinks. Maybe it's not really serious. Maybe it's all just school. I really do get punched or knocked down almost every day. It's enough to make me feel, hey, look at Louise. Meg turned following his gaze. Louise the larger was slithering along the stones of the wall towards them, moving rapidly, sinuously, her black curves shimmering purple and silver in the autumn light. Meg cried, Charles, quick. He did not move. She won't hurt us. Charles, run, she's gonna attack. But Louise stopped her advance just a few feet from Charles Wallace and raised herself up and coiling until she stood barely on the last few inches of her length, rearing up and looking around expectantly. Charles Wallace said, there's someone near, someone Louise knows. The, the dragons? I don't know, I can't see anything. Hush, let me feel. He closed his eyes, not to shut out Louise, not to shut out Meg, but in order to see with his inner eye. The dragons, I think, and a man, but more than a man, a very tall and... He opened his eyes and pointed into the shadows where the trees crowded thickly together. Look! Meg thought she saw a dim giant shape moving towards them, but before she could be sure, Fort and Bross came galloping across the orchard, barking wildly. It was not his angry bark, but the loud announcing bark with which he greeted either of the Murray parents when they had been away. Then, with his heavy black tail lifted straight out behind him, his nose pointing and quivering, he stalked the length of the orchard, jumped the wall to the north pasture, and ran, still sniffing, to one of the big glacial rocks. Charles Wallace, panting with effort, followed him. He's going to where my dragons were. Come on, Meg. Maybe he's found humans. She hurried after boy and dog. How would you know a dragon's droppings? Humans probably look like bigger and better cow pies. Charles Wallace was down on his hands and knees. Look! On the moss around the rock was a small drift of feathers. They did not look like bird feathers. They were extraordinarily soft and sparkling at the same time. And between the feathers were bits of glinting silver gold, leaf-shaped scale, which Meg thought might as well belong to dragons. You see, Meg, they were here. My dragons were here. And we'll stop there. <laughs>